right, so more from the TCM perspective, is actually Lauren and I go to a lot of the same lectures on functional medicine, so a lot of the carryover information as far as thyroid is concerned is very interesting stuff in the autoimmune relationship, um, and also the whole stat of 80 to 90% of Hashimoto's. I should say, thyroid problems or hypothyroid is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so it was kind of interesting and in understanding more about the whole um, nature of it and how much dietary aspects are really important to take care of. Uh, in Chinese medicine, it's always been in the past that, that the nutrition was actually the first thing that was looked at. That was always the key thing, it was like looking at your nutrition and your lifestyle and really trying to target that first. And then when that wasn't working, then, then they would go to the herbs and the acupuncture. But it was always like, first you look at what are you doing with your health? What can we do lifestyle-wise that can be changed that will make you in a better state of health? Um, and so with thyroid, I think part of the reason why it's so much on the, on the rise, or a lot of, I should say, a lot of autoimmune stuff, we were discussing this earlier, is, is just there's so many toxins and stuff in our environment now. There's so many things that we didn't deal with in the past. Um, in our plastic, in our pesticides, our hormones. I mean, there's so many levels that we get on a daily basis. Radiation, you know, sitting in front of our computers and our iPads and our cell phones. And I mean, there's a lot more that our bodies, I think, are dealing with now than they ever did before. And then plus the way they're modifying our food. So I can see why those kinds of autoimmune issues come up more to the forefront and can really affect the thyroid gland too. And since we're focusing on that one today, um, I just wanted to mainly state some of those precursors. And of course our diet um, is a big factor. When in Chinese medicine when they look at thyroid issues, most of the time it is about eating more dampening foods, you know, if you're having too much dairy, too much rich foods, um, sodden wheat they talk about, or like the, like the heavier, heavier foods that might be um, creating more problems for your spleen. It's like usually in Chinese medicine we talk about spleen stomach function more and we talk about digestion to the same gut, but it's implied, it's like it covers like the whole like digestive system when we say spleen stomach most of the time. So when I refer to that, that's kind of what I'm talking about too, because we'll start saying spleen stomach, but we're talking about the very um, engenderment properties that you need for the spleen and stomach in Chinese medicine. It's like how you break down the food. Are you able to break down the food? Can you absorb it? And and you need that to be able to make blood in the body and for it to you know nourish the rest of your system. So that's a big part of it is making sure that the spleen and stomach. So that is one of the patterns so that you'll see more often in Chinese medicine is spleen influence um, is big. And so if the spleen is not working effectively and not able to do its function at the stomach, then you're going to have more problems with being able to convert and transfer that, that food and nutrition to the rest of your body. Um, interestingly, when she was showing the slide earlier as far as the conversion levels of thyroid, trying to get the thyroid hormone, it very much shows like Chinese medicine the way we look at it too because there is the the digestive aspect, of course, we'd say like the gut part of it, where you need to make sure that there is um, the ability to pull or get the T3 conversion happening there. But also, before it even gets to the gut, also the liver. And the liver is another area we look at. It's like a lot of times it's the whole uh, whatever acting on earth, for those that are you know, used to the Chinese vernacular there. It's like spleen deficiency with liver chi depression is a big factor. And so if the liver is not, if it's depressed and it's not able to function properly, then you're going to have problems with conversion. It's not going to be able to convert the T4 to T3 as readily. And then if our gut is also affected, or our digestive system is not able to engender properly, then it's also going to be not able to do the conversion either. And so there's like two places that are really important to be able to get that T3 uptake back to the, you know, for the thyroid to be able to work effectively, and then it wouldn't be able to. But the other thing that she also brought up was the adrenals importance, right? And a lot of times we forget the adrenals are sitting right on top of what? Kidneys. Our kidneys, right? And so there's that whole influence that kidney energetics has. And so and that's the other big part of it. If it's not spleen chi deficiency, you know, and a liver chi depression, a lot of times it's that dampening effect that starts putting out the fire of our kidneys over time. And so it may be like your lifestyle choices, you know, maybe not getting enough sleep or over like burning yourself out basically. Um, and those things are going to end up putting out the fire of the kidney. So 
the symptoms you expect with like a kidney yawn deficiency are sluggishness, right? You're fatigued. Um, most of the time, like when we think about uh, kidney yang shi, we think about loose stools, but a lot of times it can be constipation, which is really common with thyroid insufficiency. A lot of women have sluggish stools, uh, but it could be the other, like if there's a lot of uh, dysregulation or something going on with the gut. A lot of times it's constipation, dry skin. Um, and if you think about it a little bit more with, you need to have a spark of kidney yang to be able to flare up spleen's ability to break down and digest things. And so if you're putting out the fire, there's no fire to help with engenderment. Also, another uh, side effect with uh, thyroid deficiency is uh, anemia can come up too. So you may have some anemic issues with your patient. So you may be looking at blood deficiencies, but then you're also seeing like the kidney yang is affected, their spleen's not breaking down and digesting well, you know, they're coming in tired. Um, and I'm also going to talk about BBT trying, we haven't mentioned that one yet, but that's really good when you're, when you're looking at thyroid cases. Because usually when I have someone come in, I should start at that. Um, I do have them fill out some, you know, actually a fertility history, so I get a really good idea of what's going on with them, what they've tried, what medications they're taking, you know, I should say what medications they've tried for help in their whole uh, fertility protocol. Uh, and how long they've been trying, and then also a regular history. It's like, what else have you, you know, what else, what else is going on with you that we need to find out? And so between the two of them, you can usually pretty much see what's happening and figure out diagnostically what you need to really focus on. But it does go back to the diet stuff too, is a lot of times a person's got to be willing to make some changes, because most of the fertility cases I see coming into clinic are very stressed out individuals, um, type A personalities very commonly, um, and they just want it now and they don't know what to do but there's all this stress that's going on which of course is taxing their kidneys more right their adrenals are getting even more taxed in the process which doesn't help the whole kidney component and so I talk about kidney yang but there's still like the kidney in and yang of it you need to have both sides of the puzzle that are working uh, yin has to really help more with the whole follicular side it's like the more there is blood that's prolific that's really helping support uh, the endometrium, the follicular growth, that's all super important. And if we don't have that, then we're not going to have, it won't matter if you know ovulation happens, if you don't have a good endometrium to implant into, or you don't have a good follicle that's going to get fertilized. So you need to have that. And the other aspect, of course, is making sure that ovulation happens. Typically at ovulation, what we look at in Chinese medicine is that you need to have good qi and blood circulation need to make sure that that's moving properly. Um, and also the other is that you have adequate kidney yang to be able to help the temperatures come up. As it's like, uh, if you look at um, progesterone, it's kind of like the yang organs, where I look at it, it's like yang, it's hot, it, it helps bring up the temperatures, it keeps luteal phase defect, where you get these drops in temperatures happening, it keeps the chart maintaining during that latter part instead of dropping prematurely um, and having an earlier cycle. And so young is really important at that phase, but it's also important right at ovulation. You need to have that good, warm surge that helps it come up. And so actually, well, I will write on the board now. Hold on a second. <laughs> I've never talked with a mic and written on the board at the same time. So. That's your luteal phase. Sorry, follicular phase and luteal phase, and here's your ovulation. Okay. Normally, like when you're looking at temperatures. Sorry. Normally, when you're looking at temperatures, do I have a microphone? Okay. The temperatures typically in the follicular phase are normally going to be between like 97, 97, 5. And if you're doing a BDT chart, typically what we ask patients to do is first thing in the morning, right when they wake up, take a have a good thermometer that's reliable and place it in your mouth, take your take your um, your temperature and do it regularly every day at the same time. Technically they should be in bed for at least three hours of sleep rested time before they do this. If they just hop down and try to take it, it's not going to be accurate. You need to be as consecutive and consistent as possible. So you want to see it can range a little bit through here, but it's staying right around here. And then if you have a good ovulation, there's going to be a dip in temperature and then a good surge in one day. Okay, it's not like a slow 
uh, like the slow meandering effect kind of coming up. Usually this right here is, is more of like a spleen kidney yang shoe, or at least spleen shi shoe with some dampening effects that's, that's not allowing for a good surge in temperature. So you want to see that happening. If you're getting this going on, it's usually indicating that, you know, yang is deficient. And so you need to help get some more warming herbs in the formulas, maybe even like right before ovulation, so that it's kind of overlapping that yin and blood time, but enough where it's giving that signal for the body to kind of pick up the slack and get some warmth going right there and helping the ovulation happen. And then um, if they don't have, if they didn't, let's say they did get like a, a decent ovulation, maybe it comes up a little bit, but then they get like a dip, and you can get one dip actually during the luteal phase and it's like an estrogen surge and that can be totally normal, but it will come back up, maybe just you get a few degrees dip, but it comes with about a few degrees, like point degrees dip, and then it will come right back up and then usually stay up. And that's what you want to see for a good luteal phase, you know, at least like 12 to 14 days is good. If they're not getting that though, they're getting more frequent dips, you know, where it's like coming down or a long dip and then it starts coming down already. This is like showing the alluvial phase defect. That's what you're looking at is these drops in temperature which still goes back to more like a spleen and kidney yang shi kind of state. Um, so you're going to usually see symptoms there too. The other thing though, since we're talking about in relation to thyroid, if someone is having temperatures that never quite, actually to say overall, never quite above 97.5, there's a, that's a really good chance that they've got hypothyroid conditions going on. If it's even lower than that, worsened thyroid condition, okay? So it's like hypothyroid is definitely there's that cold sensation. Most people are pretty cold when they have hypothyroid. It's like really hard to get warm. Everyone else in the room is like dressed normally and they've got the jacket on, you know? They're cold, they're, their feet can't get warm. They have to wear socks to bed. It's like spring and they're like, do, do you have another blanket, okay? So it's, they're the ones that you're seeing those signs and symptoms, but maybe you're not seeing enough where you're thinking, oh, it's a hypothyroid case. But there are ways of like, you know, definitely easier and easier these days to get testing. And for those of you that in here that are acupuncturists or on your way to becoming acupuncturists, there's a lot more labs that are friendly to us as far as, you know, not having to be a, necessarily a doctor before you send someone out for testing and also more, um, financially easy for your patients. You know, LabCorp um, uses, like, well, I should say Direct Lab uses uh, LabCorp quite a bit. Direct Labs has great deals as far as testing goes, so it's not going to be crazy out of pocket, especially if you have patients that don't have any insurance. So it's kind of nice if you have some options for that. There's actually a couple other ones that are really, really reasonable where you can do thyroid tests. You can also check for antibodies and see if it's Hashimoto's. Um, you can check with reverse T3, which is something that they rarely check. Most of the time, if you go to the doctor and you ask him to do the lab work, you're lucky. You, you get like TSH and maybe T4. You usually have to request a little bit more, and then sometimes they may balk at that. Unless they're really, you're saying, you know, my hair's falling out all over the place, and you have enough symptoms that are substantiating it, then maybe they might go further. But if you're the doc, you know, if you're the doctor, this is your patient that you're talking about. You can order those labs really specific through these companies and and have it totally come back with some really good information for you. So I highly advise you to check if you're seeing a really generalized low temperatures. And it may be also like in the follicular phase here that it never reaches 97. They're the ones that come into you and they they've been doing like the uh, applications on their phones for the fertility and they're your charts are all subclinical. They're like all below 97. It's like you're going, oh, this is pretty good, and you realize it's all below 97 degrees. It's like 96 or between 96 and 97. It's like that's that's too low. That's definitely like a cold, generalized yawn going across the board. So you've got to warm that person up through the whole cycle, not just during the luteal phase, but you start giving them yawn tonics during the follicular phase, and then you continue that into the yawn phase too, just to make sure that that's uh, getting taken care of. And then of course, dietarily, you have to make sure that they're changing whatever factors are causing a lot of dampening. As glad you brought up all like the food sources and stuff too, because you know, that's what you learn off the bat if you ever had a thyroid insufficiency, and I have too. And so it's like, oh, don't eat broccoli. Don't eat some of the cruciferous vegetables, especially when they're raw, because they will keep the thyroxin from being able to uh, 
get absorbed properly. And so the same with soy. Don't do dairy products and peanut butter. Peanut butter, another one. So there's like some, some ones that you, don't, you know, wouldn't think about necessarily would be hard in your diet, but you can see how they have a dampening effect. So that's, that's something also to keep in mind is what foods you're taking in. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say. Now, from the Sage's Salvation Records, this is one quote I liked. As a female infertility results from insufficiency of the penetrating and conception vessels, okay? So there's not enough happening from the Chang and Ren. Um, or kidney chi deficiency cold. So it's just kind of reminding you of like, the connection the kidney has between the Chang and Ren and how closely those are associated with everything that has to do with fertility. You know, your, your Chang is, is totally helping with blood regulation into this area. And then you have a conception vessel that's also everything in the reproductive system as well. So you have like, the, your yin energy, your yin chi that has to nourish and regulate. And then you have like your blood energetics that also has to regulate the whole uh, uterus and reproductive organs in the area. So it's just a good reminder like how important like, the, kidney, uh, the kidney is in this case. And so giving your patients a little bit more as far as lifestyle recommendations, trying to find ways that they can de-stress um, I know that's a toughie, because some people just think that's their lifestyle and their work is really taxing, but uh, trying to find some other options for them, like a safe place or something that will calm them down, and then changing their diet. And they have to be willing to do that. Some people come in and they want you to fix everything for them, but they really have to do some stuff themselves if they're, you know, if they're really serious about their fertility. So um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to add. And then we can do some of the questions too. Oh, I was just going to say, um, the other thing is like with thyroid insufficiency, uh, Lauren also mentioned about, uh, me, Dr. Dawn, oh. it's okay, okay. <laughs> she also mentioned as far as uh, the, uh, the, the actual insulin and stuff, the resistance going on with PCOS. And that a lot of, there are a lot of patients that have PCOS that do have thyroid insufficiency as well, which makes a lot of sense because they're, we look at in Chinese medicine as more like a phlegm component or a damp component. And when it's like, you know, fluid-filled cysts are there and, and forming bilaterally. For those that don't know, PC, is anyone in here know about PCOS? Actually, does anyone in here not know about PCOS? Okay, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it's a bilateral condition. It really affects uh, fertility overall because it's fluid-filled cysts, so you're not getting good follicles. And so it's considered like a damp or phlegm type condition. And the kidneys are again something that help with transforming phlegm and damp. And so the more you know strong that they are to be able to you know combat that, the better. So with herbs, if there is a phlegm component, it, it, like if there was thyroid stuff going on too, there might be nodulation that they're actually experiencing. And so you'd be checking the, the nodes there, seeing if there's or seeing if there is any nodes or, or phlegmy type of structures and stuff going on here. If there was, and you definitely want to make sure that you put phlegm resolving herbs in the formula. The other thing I'm just going to mention before I stop is that the one thing about Hashimoto's is that the uh, whole the whole deal with taking iodine is really kind of iffy and it can cause a lot of problems if you have Hashimoto's. And so uh, one thing I want to kind of work with too is because a lot of my hypothyroid conditions, they normally have seaweeds in your formulas. That's like a typical thing for lessening nodulation and it's full of iodine. And so I don't know if that's going to be something that might have to be worked around a little bit. You might have to kind of see with your patients how they respond to it, or else try and find other phlegm resolving herbs to put in a formula that are not seaweed based that will still have softening effects on it. So if you have done testing, you know it's Hashimoto's, they've got the antibodies, they're showing the high TSH level, and they're demonstrating all the signs and symptoms of it, then you might want to be careful about telling them to do iodine-rich foods, okay? So that's what I want to say in closing, okay? And if you guys have questions later, please feel free to come up and ask, and you can get my new cards for Old Town, too, okay? <laughs>